Well, good morning, gentlemen. Certainly good to have you all here on this Good Friday morning as we start out our Good Friday men's prayer breakfast. And yeah, the coffee is brewing and it's looking really yummy. Better than all that. We never wanted to let another year go by. Last year, we missed out on a Good Friday men's prayer breakfast. Not this year. We're going to do it. It's going to be a virtual experience. The coffee is getting ready. It's almost done. So here I am in the kitchen whooping up some pancakes, a little bit of flatjack action. And man, I am hoping that <clears throat> you, likewise, will enjoy a nice pancake cooking for yourself as we look forward to <clears throat> exactly what Jesus has done for us on the cross. This is why we gather here. So I'm hoping today you'll be able to get some yummy batter. Get your boys together, even your daughters together. If you don't have any boys, throw some blueberries into those pancakes. Oh, have a bunch of fruit ready to go. Of course, you got to have the bacon and the syrup. And man, I'm telling you, let's come together before the presence of a holy God, enjoying a great breakfast, some beautiful music by Brooke Hopkins, and a marvelous, challenging message from Dave McCutcheon. Miss you guys, and soon and very soon, we'll be able to come together to celebrate before the presence of a holy God all that he has done for us. Remember, on this Good Friday, all your sins have been washed away. All right. So let's spend some time in worship. my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays.
when I survey the wondrous cross on with the prince of glory die my riches gain excited to be here with you this morning. My name is David McCutcheon, though my friends have called me Cutch since I was a little boy, which, by the way, I was when I met your pastor. Let's start by praying, please. Father, I praise you for your graciousness and power, and I ask that you would help me today to stay focused and to present a plan to immerse ourselves in the faith, to influence our family and friends in such a way that you would be glorified. Amen. Um, so I have four things today, so you can kind of follow along and uh, know and I'll be finishing up. Um, the first is I want to tell you just a little bit about me so that you have uh, some understanding as to why we're going to discuss what we discuss. Um, and then I want to do a little scripture for us to ponder. We'll be in Deuteronomy 11 if you um, want to take a look at that at some point. And then I have some resources uh, for you to consider. And then I'm going to wrap it up with um, some of Jesus' words when he was on trial right before his crucifixion. So the little bit about me, um, 41 years ago this summer, I was a 13-year-old kid who showed up at Summer's Best Two Weeks for the very first time. It was a life-changing experience for me. Young men like your pastor who lived out their faith in front of me made me realize that I needed Christ. 
I did not come from a strong Christian home, and pretty much all of my faith came from camp. I did have um, my grandma Kachi. Uh, she was the one strong believer in my family, and she was also dirt poor, but she saved enough money for me um, every year to go to the Summer's Best Day Camp at her church. Really, it was just like the one that you have here in your church. Um, eventually, several years later, as I got older, I asked my father if I could go to the resident camp, and that is where I met Ted. When I was done being a camper and I was old enough, I became a counselor at Summer's Best too. And I marveled at all of my co-counselors, like your pastor, who came from strong Christian homes, sometimes going back generations. And it was then that my life's goal was set. Um, I wanted to have that kind of family. I'm here today as a proud father of four children um, who have proudly worn the Galatian shirt at camp, by the way. My oldest three have all been captains and eventually counselors. Two of them will be counselors this summer again. Um, and my youngest is looking forward to going back to camp. She missed so many of her friends last year when she wasn't able to go. I have to tell you, there are days that I tear up when I realize that they are where I was, except they know the faith and they come from a family that values it. I am very literally living my dream. The Apostle John wrote in one of his letters, I have no greater joy than to know my children walk in the truth. I have that joy. I am also married to a fantastic wife who, by her own admission, was immature in the faith when we first met, but I embarrassingly tell you now, she's kind of raced by me in her commitment. Let me show you a picture. Um, this is of my family at my daughter's graduation. If I just move me out of it, that would be a great picture, wouldn't it? Um, my daughter graduated last year and she was salutatorian. We were very proud of her and very thankful that she gets her brains from her mother. Um, so that's just a little bit about who I was as I grew up and why I want to talk to you today. First, let me commend you for investing in your faith already simply by being an active member in Ted's church and coming to this men's breakfast. My goal today is to beg you to view your family as the Hebrews viewed the promised land. After they fled Egypt and then rebelled, it took 40 years for them to get there. And in the last few weeks of Moses' life, he commissioned Joshua to be their next leader. And he also gave them this speech, which is in Deuteronomy. Let me pull it up here. I'm going to start in verse 13 of Deuteronomy 11. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. And then he goes on to tell how God will bless them if they do that, to love the Lord their God and to serve him with all their heart and with all their soul. But then he jumps down to verse 16 after he tells of the blessings and he says, but be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. How could this possibly happen after all God has done for them? I'll tell you how, because every single surrounding nation followed other gods. Many of you are surrounded by people who worship other gods. Maybe they claim to be Christians, but they worship money or sports or popularity, all things that can keep our focus away from the faith. I have a quote that hangs in my classroom that says, what is popular is not always right. And what is right is not always popular. Then it picks up in verse 17, then the Lord's anger, if they follow other gods, the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. And then verse 18, this is the part, boy, if you memorize scripture and I encourage you to do so, memorize these few verses. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your sons, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. 
Look, I don't know how God will bless you if you do these things. I don't know that he will give you long life in a land that he has prepared for you or anything that he promised the Hebrews. But I do know that in verse 18, he lays out exactly what he wants fathers to do with their sons. And I want you to notice that he did not say send them to Sunday school. And he did not say let the youth pastor take care of it. Absolutely, it's great that your kids go to Sunday school, and if they're old enough to go to youth group, by all means, send them. But what he did say was to fix his words in our hearts and our minds and to teach them to our sons. It is our job as fathers, and we need to do it well. Let me quickly say that we are not a perfect family by any stretch. My kids are not the best kids ever, and they will jump at the chance to tell you that I'm not making anyone's top 10 list of dads. But as imperfect as we are, we have a shared faith. We talk about it openly. We discuss theological issues. Sometimes we argue. They have challenged me to be better. Permit me to share with you some of the ways that we immersed ourselves in the faith as our kids were growing up. By the way, um, if you're not a parent yet or your children are older, um, you can come alongside a family and help them. If you're not old enough to have kids yet, great. Now's the perfect time to make that plan so that you can have the same dream that I had when I was younger. Um, it's interesting to note that Ted and I have a mutual friend that we met completely apart from one another. And he and his wife have no children of their own, but they um, disciple and mentor their nephews. And I assure you, their nephews are better for it. Um, so if that's an opportunity for you, then please, by all means, take advantage of that because there are many families who need that help. So um, there are several things that we did with the kids when, when they were younger. We read the Bible to them um, from the moment they were born. And uh, actually, my wife went downstairs to dig out some stuff. And we have the original uh, baby's Bible that we used. One of my daughters, no doubt, duct taped it together at some point when we were older. And it's pretty old and beat. But this is um, where we started. This was the oldest one. Um, I have multiple resources here sitting at the table. And, and so when we moved on to this children's Bible, it too is kind of fallen apart, as you can see. Um, and as they got older, um, the Bible story books got older with them until we were able to read from Scripture itself. But um, we immerse them in the Scriptures. This is the heart of Deuteronomy, and I would encourage you to do that. One of the other staples in our house was Veggie Tales. Um, hopefully, you have experienced Veggie Tales. Uh, this is my favorite, Larry Boy. Um, and so, listen, my youngest is sixteen. My oldest is 22. And uh, when we get together, we still watch Veggie Tales. So that's a family secret. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, so that these are great resources for you um, if your kids are younger. We listen to Adventures in Odyssey on the radio. It's on uh, Word FM every weekday at 8 o'clock, I believe. It's still there. We own a lot of the CDs, and we would listen. Um, these are all fabulous ways for your kids to not only have good, clean fun, but to learn about the faith as well. Um, Narnia books. Um, so my first exposure to C.S. Lewis was in this um, this book right here. Actually, one of my day camp counselors. So that I was 10. So that was, suffice it to say, I was a long time ago. And this is the actual book. He bought it for us um, when I was in day camp. And um, this, I don't really keep too many things. There aren't many um, high priority things that I like to keep around, but this is certainly one of them. Um, not only did I fall in love with the land of Narnia, but in C.S. Lewis, um, he is a fantastic author, has lots of books for adults to read. And I would encourage you to, if his name's attached to it, you probably want to read it. Another thing that we did was the Awana program. 
I'm not sure if you have one around. Um, I don't know of any anymore. There was one in Dorseyville where we sent our kids and they had an absolute blast there. It was a lot of fun um, and they memorized more scripture than I will ever know. So it was fantastic. We also had um, several family traditions that we like to do. Um, obviously, we prayed at night and we used a specific plan. It was called the Acts plan. Um, it starts with A for adoration. So we would basically tell God how great he was. And then C was for confession. Pretty self-explanatory. T was for thanksgiving. So for all the things that we are thankful for. And then the S was for supplication to ask God. So we actually did two S's. Um, the first one was for other people, where we would pray for people that we knew who had some needs. And then we would pray for ourselves. We did that to follow Summer's Best I'm Third motto, where God comes first, others are second, and then ourselves third. Um, every Holy Thursday. So yesterday, um, we made a bunch of bread, little tiny loaves of bread, and we would pass them out with um, a small thing of juice and the scripture that dealt with the Passover meal. Um, and we would pass them out to all of our neighbors. We've gotten up to about 150 um, where we pass those out on Holy Thursday. Our kids don't have school or Actually, we might have kept them home from school if they had school one day to do that. Um, so that's always been fun. At Halloween, we do ghosting. We call it holy ghosting. And we would, um, this was probably one of the most fun things we did. We would sneak up on their house and we would leave them a treat with a balloon and um, and a scripture passage and tell them that they were holy ghosted. And um, and then we would run. And, and there's a lot of fun stories about that. Um, we started our own day camp, just like you have here at your church. Uh, we patterned it after summer's best and, and we're still running that. We had to take last summer off like so many things, but um, we're making plans for that to be there. And um, the one other tradition that we sort of did that I want to mention to you today is that we took Sunday mornings off from all activities um, that belonged to church. So there were no soccer games or track meets or any other activities um, that made a pretty lasting impression on my kids and, and a lasting impression on many of their teammates and their families, too. Um, but we would never sacrifice church um, for sports. So that was really, really important to us. As they got older, we did a lot of things. Our church did um, the story, which is, um, this is, it's all scripture, but it's not all of the scripture. And it went through um, the main themes and you would read it as the, the Bible as one smooth story. So that was pretty good. Um, you might have heard of Lee Strobel, and he has several books, The Case For, and The Case for Christ is a fabulous book, and it's an older uh, for adults, uh, but they also have, this was a children's version. So we would read that together when they were younger. And then they have a student version. So we would read that together as they got a little older. We also did um, this devotional was my favorite. It was called um, Dinner Table Devotions. We actually did it for breakfast. So ours was called Breakfast Table Devotions, um, but it was fantastic. It was pretty thorough um, and it was a, a great resource um, for our children. We would continue to read the Bible. You know, when I was... Um, Younger, I, I talked to Jim Welsh, who was the founder of Summer's Best, and he told me that when he was younger and he started preaching, he started preaching out of the Living Bible so that people in his congregation could understand it. And I have a daily Bible from uh, the Living Bible, which I really enjoy. If you're going to memorize scripture, I probably wouldn't use the Living Bible. I would use a more traditional version. But if you've never read scripture before, it's a pretty easy read and a, and a good thing for you to be able to follow through on. And so we started the kids doing things like that. Focus on the Family has a, another thing. This is really for um, maybe some older high school kids uh, and college age kids about um, the reason for our faith. And the videos are about a half an hour long and they really get into the science behind 
proving the fact that, you know, everything that God says is actually real and true. So um, I would encourage this. It's fantastic and it's an easy to listen to. Um, and finally, um, as they got older, we encouraged this. Um, it's called the One Minute Bible for Students. Um, we actually buy this for all of our counselors as they graduate from high school so that they can go on to college and continue their devotion. So um, I highly recommend this. It is a fantastic um, devotional and really it doesn't take very long for them to do. So one thing that always comes up um, when I talk to people about doing all this is that they're a little intimidated with sharing their faith. They don't feel like they have all the answers or they don't know everything. Um, my answer to that is, yeah, who does? I, I don't have all the answers. Um, your pastor doesn't have all the answers. I, I just kind of study and, and do the best I can. And, and if your kids come up with something that you don't know, or, or if you share it with somebody else and, and you don't know the answer, you, you just tell them. And, and if they're earnest, maybe you just say, Hey, let's look that up together. Nothing, nothing shows love with your kid other than, than studying together like that. That would be absolutely fantastic. Ask questions. Um, I'm really fortunate to have multiple pastors as friends. I have a next door neighbor here who is the pastor down the street. And, you know, we talk all the time. I ask them questions. Um, do that. Look it up. Find things um, to be able to help each other out. That's a wonderful experience. Don't be intimidated by that by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I do have some things for you, though, uh, if you want to look into it. There's some apologetic stuff. Um, this is Josh McDowell. It's More Than a Carpenter. Pretty thin book, easy to read. Um, and it's a basic apologetics course where you kind of learn why we believe what we believe. He has multiple books, by the way. There's a, um, a slightly larger one called A Ready Defense. It's a little bigger, as you can see. Um, there's a third one that's actually um, evidence demands a verdict, and it's it's a college course. So like if you really want to know everything and you can do that. One thing that's been really helpful for me, too, is this R.C. Sproul book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. Uh, everything is like one or two page answers. They're pretty easy for people like me. And so it's a pretty simple kind of thing there. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. Focus on the family. I keep going back to them because they have so much good stuff, but they also have the truth project. Um, this takes, this is a little intense. Um, each video is about an hour and um, there's some studying that deals with it. So we did this as a Bible study with a group of people and it takes some work to get through. I'm not going to lie, but it is very, very thorough and, and you might like that. And finally, the last thing that I really encourage people to read is a tiny little book by Andy Stanley called How all good is good enough. And it kind of dispels the myth of a works-based salvation. Um, and I just think that the better you're able to articulate that, the better that you are. And that is most of my resources. So I'm hopeful that you enjoy that. And I will um, try and get Ted all of that information. So if you want any of that, I can give you my information and you can contact me and I will gladly help you with any of that. Um, let me leave you with this. So Jesus was on trial the night before his crucifixion and the trial lasted all night long and into the morning. And Jesus really didn't say a whole lot during that time. But at one point he had answered Pilate and mentioned his kingdom and Pilate jumped on that and said, so you are a king. And Jesus answered and said, you say correctly that I am a king. And for this, I have been born. And for this, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Listen, Jesus was born to testify to the truth. Jesus was the truth that Pilate so desperately needed. And Jesus died later that day as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. And his resurrection three days later is the turning point in history. We need to testify to the truth. And there is no better place to do that than with your family. Thank you so much. I have you, hope you have a very happy and blessed Easter.
Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell is made, this gift of Yeah.